Hello everybody, this is Dr. Samuel Zinner. Welcome to my desk here in the mountain village of Aula in Tuscany, Italy. Tonight I'm being joined by Francisco Mello in Portugal, who has some questions for me on the Quran in response to an interview I gave uh, previously on the Myth Vision podcast on intertextuality of the Quran. So, uh, welcome, Francisco. First, to get uh, this first part of the uh, the topic over with, like to, not to be, you know, insist too much on it. But um, sure, sure, sure. first, um, I'd like to ask you why, uh, just on this part that uh, that I talked about uh, previously, why do you think that? Why did the why did Muhammad say, uh, "I am at the this Quran." Musaddikan lima baina yadehi. Why call the previous scriptures uh, Siddiq or, or uh, why say why say that they are reliable and completely uh, you know why did he not go like a more uh, conventional route of saying no you, you've uh, you've interpolated the, your stuff and uh, you've corrupted the stuff and I'm here to bring you back to the original. Why did he order like the Jews to to go back to the Torah, like in Surah 5:43, the, the the Christians to go back to the gospel? Because any Christian that's in the seventh century is going to say, "Okay, I'll go to the gospel," like you said. Wait, but you say that Jesus is not the Son of God, and you say that God is not the Father. God is not a spiritual Father. Uh, we also agree with you that God, He's not the biological Father, if that's what you mean. But yeah, but we already agree with that. So that's if you think that's what it. What it means, then you're just a foolish Arab pagan because we never say that he's a biological father. Um, so you he, you deny our basic doctrines, and we go to the gospel. And gospel for us means Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and uh, they call you basically an antichrist. So how can you this and the Jews as well? The Jews, I mean, the Jews would say uh, you contradict the law of Moses, um, and you say that the law of Moses can be abrogated, like in Surah 350 and Surah 55. Uh, not directly, but it's implied in those things. So, uh, and abrogated for the children, for the Jews. So, not not meaning it's not ah, it's a new law for the Gentiles. No, it says that uh, it, it says quite clearly that Jesus came to abrogate certain parts of the Torah, and that's completely anathema to Judaism. So, how how did Muhammad, knowing the scripture so well, how could he make these these, how could he make these uh, these claims? I, I don't understand why 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 stake his reputation and affirm that the Jews and Christians have the, the full truth, but were just like rebellious towards it? Well, I think uh, the first observation to make would be that since there's such a, uh, an apparent glaring contradiction, right, at least uh, from, from your uh, and, and others' viewpoints, that that already raises uh, a flag, right? To the critical observer, right? Yeah. Uh, they should immediately question whether something is, whether an entire paradigm perhaps is being overlooked, right? Because often when we find such g glaring examples of what seems to be, uh, you know, so, uh, some preposterous um, scenario. Um, something major is probably being overlooked, right? That's producing this perplexity. And once you take, a, you know, a, a, an, an unknown piece of the puzzle into account, then things start to fall into place. And then, you know, it, it doesn't seem so preposterous after all. Well, one may not agree, right, with the position of of the prophet of Islam, but at least, you know, one may be able to start to see, oh, well, yeah, I can see where he may have been coming from and the, the right. logic that must have been behind his thinking, right? All right, so exactly. this is, I think this is uh, one one point uh, that starts to set things in perspective, and that is, um, I think that, uh, all right, let's be generous and Let's grant uh, <clears throat> that, that the prophet of Islam or the Quran, when it's uh, recognizing the earlier revelations, right, as 
<clears throat> as that, as inspired, right, as righteous and truthful, because I think the Arabic term actually means both, <clears throat> right? So it has the the valence also of its Hebrew cognate, right, Sadiq. So <clears throat> they're 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 both righteous uh, and and truthful. Uh, that 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 was a sincere declaration, you know that it's. You know, it actually was believed, so it's just not for the sake of rhetoric, right? Or, or, or for you know some empty rhetorical statement. That all right? So all right. So he actually believes that these former revelations, um, you know, were inspired, were are, are righteous um, and truthful. But at the same time, uh, obviously. The concern is there, and the charge is there, that the interpretation, right, by some Jews and some Christians, of those righteous scriptures, uh, right, is right, not righteous, not truthful, right. So yeah. um, it's in error, either th through malice or or through you know unintentional ignorance, right. So so keep in mind that these same type of polemics right, were operative among Christians themselves against each other hmm. and among Jews uh, against each other, among themselves. They had these, these same types of uh, charges, right, that, well, you're, you're corrupting, you're misinterpreting, what you're saying is blasphemy, right? So Jews hurling this against other Jews, Christians hurling this against other Christians. You think of uh, Surah 112, Surah al class right? Uh, right? Say, yeah, he say, he say, God is one, right? And etc. Uh, etc. Et uh, this is echoing the Shema Yisrael, right? Uh, Deuteronomy 6:4. Right, so Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Right, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. All right, so here we have the Quran echoing the uh, the the proclamation of uh, the Jewish proclamation of monotheism. And um, but then it goes on; it seems to polemically engage with you know what what sounds like uh, an allusion to the Nicene Creed, right? And then sort of right. negates that, that, you know, God is, uh, God doesn't beget and God is not begotten. So it seems to be, yeah. but actually, uh, as a paper I wrote on, on that surah uh, documented, the technical language that's being used in surah 112 actually perfectly matches uh, a type of Christian, right, well-known uh, anti-Nicene Christian theology, right? That was preserved mm. and transmitted in Syria. And, uh, right, we can find echoes of it, for instance, in the pseudo-Clementine literature. Uh, that's significant because I believe that the, the pseudo-Clementine pseudo literature is actually uh, echoed in the Quran itself. Right, uh, as is uh, like the Odes of Solomon. Why do I mention the Odes of Solomon? Because that's another text that was, uh, I believe, Syrian, uh, Syrian provenance, right? And so uh, that the, the Odes of Solomon, specifically, I believe, the, the seventh. Well, it's not the seventh ode, but I believe one of the Odes of Solomon. The the, the number I forget, but I believe it is echoed in the seventh surah. Uh, but in any case, my point here is that, all right, so uh, the scenario that, that I hold to that looks credible is that there were certain uh, Christian texts, such as the Pseudo-Clementine literature and the Odes of Solomon, and preserved and transmitted in Syria. Now, these are quote-unquote Jewish Christian texts by you know the hmm. standard of several scholars not all scholars but uh many scholars respected scholars um you know the odds of solomon are, are are viewed as jewish christian you know by james h charlesworth for instance and most scholars would i think characterize the pseudo clementine literature as quasi ebionite or ebionite like if not you know ebionite as such 
But anyway, it, it seems plausible to suggest that these these uh, pieces of literature were were then carried to the Arabian Peninsula right, by the mainstream uh, Syriac speaking churches. Right. right? right. All right. That's so, very interesting. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, and, the, and this probably o overlaps with one of your other questions, and that is, right, so, um, how do we square, you know, Jewish Christian influence with the, the apparent knowledge of, you know, mainstream J Jewish, you know, rabbinic Judaism and mainstream Christianity? Well, they're not necessarily incompatible for that very reason, that these, some of these Jewish Christian texts were in fact transmitted by the mainstream churches, as odd as that might seem to be, right, to us. Right. And, you know, think of the pseudo Clementines, right? They, they attack Paul as a false apostle. And yet these were translated from Greek into Latin by, you know, mainstream uh, Christian fathers like Rufus, right? Uh, Rufinus, right? So uh, there you go. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of this uh, hurling of accusations, right? Such as you read, uh, yeah in the Quran against the people of the previous revelations, right? Among the Jews and Christians themselves, yeah. right? Um, that, that uh, if I may uh, just... Uh, yeah, please. That, yeah, that, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, it could be, that, right, that uh, Muhammad was saying, yeah, uh, those parts, those uh, ancient traditions preserved in um, Syriac corpuses and so on are the ones that are true. But then again, I'm... This is not really a like a scholarly. Uh, yeah. Well. Uh, well. Also, if you think of, uh, you mentioned, um, you know, how how could the Quran um, endorse the previous revelations? Right. Like because that's and the then attack see. certain uh, points of doctrine in those. For for example, in the Gospels. All right. right. So you you mentioned like the divinity of Jesus, but step back, take a lar larger viewpoint at that, uh, right? Because that is not all that clear, even among Christians right. themselves. There's always been debate about that. And many, many Christian groups right, uh, d deny the divinity of Jesus, reading the same gospels that, that the Nicene Christians right, are reading. Yeah. Right. But, uh, so that this make, that, is being mirrored to a certain extent, I think, in the Quran, the same type of, you know, difference of interpretation of the same basic texts that different right, groups are interpreting I, I, I and understand. understanding differently. Right, I understand. I mean, it's just so weird that uh, Muhammad or the author of the Quran uh, didn't just come out and say, like, uh, uh, your, uh, your so-called Gospel of John, don't follow that. Uh, that is, uh, you know, that is... Uh, uh, heretical, uh, pagan, uh, uh, divinizing Jesus, like, uh, it's pretty hard to argue that John doesn't think Jesus is divine or at least extremely exalted to, a, to an extent that the author would, uh, that the Quran wouldn't be, have a problem with it. So why didn't he just, like, say, don't well, follow the, the false apostle John, go back to Clement, uh, to, uh, to Clement or, uh, because, you know, that because, literature? Because the Quran is following, the genre of the Quran is prophetic discourse hmm. not, right. not 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 very technical like don't not, follow this, don't follow. Uh, well no what i mean is it's prophetic discourse it's not the genre is not apologetic treatise right right and that's that would be what you're referring to uh and right many christians would beg to differ with what you said there that the god you know the, uh, as far as the christology the gospel of john is concerned Right, there is a trope, of course, throughout uh, a lot of Christian theology that the Christology of the Gospel of John is a quote-unquote high Christology. But at the same time, uh, careful commentators are aware that that's not the only trajectory within that Gospel. There, there are, there's more than one type of Christology within the Gospel of John, and so one could latch on to whichever one had a proclivity to do that. And I'll mention two instances of, uh, let's say, it still may be a high Christology, but it's not as high 
as the other one, right? And uh, the highest would probably be like the declaration uh, of Thomas, you know, my Lord and my God, right? Or I am the Father are one, like something like that. Right, but even that, right, is not necessarily all that. That's, I wouldn't rank that as the highest, and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll tell you why. And, and then you can apply this mutatis mutandis, right, to the Quran and see what might be going on. Here is what has happened historically, even among Christians themselves, right? right? So uh, even in the first line, right, of the Gospel of John, right? So we read right. that in the beginning, the, 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 the logos, right, which is usually, I think, misrendered as a word. That's a very inadequate translation. Uh, because I believe there's a Philonic background, Philo of Alexandria, right? His his ideas are in the background of that opening passage in John. And so, you know, the in the beginning was the Lagos, that is the mind of God, the reason of God, uh, and also to a certain extent, the speech of God, insofar as the speech of God, right, emanates, or originates from the thought, right? But in any case, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. Well, and the word, excuse me, and the word was um, with God. All right, so the, the word was with ha theos. Theos with the definite article ha, the God. That's the God of Israel, the creator. And the word was theos. There it lacks the definite article. And so it must mean a God or divine. And in fact, Philo does have a passage where he tells us it is legitimate to call human beings Theos, as long as you don't use the definite article. For instance, right, the book of Exodus, uh, in there, God calls Moshe, Rabbeinu, God calls Moses, Elohim. So what does that mean, right? But in, right, so in Greek, that would be Theos without the definite article, right? So it has a different meaning. It's not talking about the creator. So, and judges, as you probably know, certain judges could be called Elohim, right? And, um, and so um, this, when you read Philo, and then on that topic, on that grammatical point, and then you read that first line of the Gospel of John, you can see that John is not equating the Logos with ha theos, with God as such, right? But with some type of emanation, right? Or, or, or right. personified uh, attribute. All right, and the other part would be there in, in John 10, right? This is what I would call a lower, higher Christology. And that is, right, yeah. and that's the chapter that, that you referred to already, where he says, uh, the Father and I are one, or I and the Father are one. Uh, but recall the argument that's being presented there, that's attributed to Jesus and, quote, unquote, the Jews, right? And that is, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they, the, the Jews are presented as saying, um, and well, this, the, the scenario is so they, they want to stone Jesus because they say, well, you, you're, a, you're a human being and you're making yourself God because you've called yourself the son of God. And Jesus' argument is then, well, he says, and I'm paraphrasing here, and I'm not trying to be flippant, but he says, well, hey, wait a minute, right? The scripture says, right, and he, and he cites Psalm 82. He says, right, have I not said that you are gods, right? And so those to whom the word of God came, right, are called gods. And so what is he talking about? He's talking about the Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. And so all the, the Torah was given to the entire nation of Israel. So all Jews uh, can be called gods, right? And so what Jesus is saying is now, why do you want to stone me when I call myself the son of God, when every Jew uh, is called a god, is called God? Right. And the scripture cannot be broken. So that's a low Christology, right? Uh, that's different right. from the first chapter in John, where it said that uh, the there is only one who is in the kolpos or the bosom or the lap of the Father, and that is the only begotten God. So the Son, this Logos figure, right? And so there, 
the Logos or the Son has a unique status that no one else has. But that's in contradiction to this other type of Christology in the 10th chapter, where Jesus is saying, look, right. I'm not the Son of God in any way that every Israelite is not, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, so within the Gospel of John itself, there, you know, you can, you, one could pick and choose, right, which Christology one wants, right? And so right. Uh, then one could say, well, that's what's happening with the Quran as well, right? So. Right. Uh, yeah, it's, in, it's interesting. Um, um, trying to uh, think about what I was going to say. Um, sure, sure. Yeah, but uh, the yeah, but there will still be no no really getting around the fact that uh, Jesus calls him that uh, there's the idea of uh, of being uh, the begotten Son of God, and that's really explicitly denied in the Quran. But but okay, I right. Okay, well, I, well I, let I, me address that, and I think the answer to that came from from an observation from Hans Kuhn, uh, the the late Catholic um, Roman Catholic theologian. Uh, Hans? Hans Kuhn, yes, K U Umlaut in G. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just died a few years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. In his trilogy, right on on Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, he points out that that the uh, and he's not the only one who's made this argument. But the argument is that when the Quran denies that Jesus is the Son of God and that God is his Father, he's not necessarily attacking Christian doctrine right, as such. What's happening there is that you have to keep in mind that the um, Arabian pagans uh, had a very um, biological understanding right, of, their, of their pantheon. And so um, that's what is really being attacked. And so often we have, uh, I think, even a mistranslation of the Quran on this point, where it seems to be attacking the belief that, that God has a son, when in fact the Arabic would better be rendered that, that God has a child, which could even mean plural, children. And so it's really attacking a, an, an Arabian pagan idea, but it does seem to be merged with the Christian belief. So my interpretation then is that what is being attacked there is a belief um, among formerly pagan Arabs like, yeah, who, have adopted, really who have adopted Christianity but have just brought along the very pagan biological understanding right, of divinity with them. Right. And so that this could be what is being attacked. Right. Yeah. And that so, yeah. So that, that anyway, that, that's Kuhn's argument, and then I've I've qualified it and and brought it a little further, right, by saying that this was uh, not because I don't I'm not convinced, right, that when this belief is attacked, that it has nothing to do with the Christian belief. It seems to me contextually it does, but it seems to be both. Right, and so the best way to to make that congruent is to posit that we're talking about um, those some who were born, right, as uh, Arabian polytheists. Now they have adopted Christianity in some loose form, right, and uh, just carried. It's as if they probably still believed in other deities as well, some and retained their belief in some of the pagan Arab, uh, Arabian uh, uh, divinities, right? And then just bring yeah, Jesus I, I recall, into the pantheon. Right. I recall just a, a sort of a, a video that I watched, uh, not very scholarly, but uh, still interesting, about by um, the author uh, historian uh, Tom Holland. And he, mm. he was like, uh, investigating the beginnings of Islam and um, he went to a, um, a ch uh, sort of a, a church kind of in um, uh, what is now uh, of that in uh, southern Israel and yeah he said that mm, this seems to be the type of thing that the Quran is attacking like a sort of um, a semi church but with the pagan symbols intermixed with Christian symbols as well so yeah mm -hmm. that could certainly mm -hmm. be right and a lot a, a community. Uh, yeah and a lot of the um the argumentation in the Quran also 
does seem to resemble th this um, various quote unquote sectarian Jewish Christian right, critiques of, hmm. of uh, Pauline Christianity, basically. Right. right. Uh, as it was, right, in later centuries, at least. Right. And now th this favor, right, I mean, this theory of Jewish Christian, you know, the sectarian Ebionite, for instance, and other, t that sense of Jewish Christian uh, influence on nascent Islam is falling out of favor among scholars. But there are still many, many scholars, very eminent scholars, who, who continue to argue that uh, plausibly, like Gies Rumza, right, is I think probably the, 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 the most important one uh, currently active, right, and so. Right, uh, yeah, right. because so, that seems to be a really, uh, can I, I just, uh, sure, may please, I just uh, yeah, uh, because I just uh, remember, like, I recall uh, Stephen, uh, Dr. Stephen Shoemaker mm -hmm. saying like, oh, that's a non-starter. I mean, there's no Jewish Christians at all in the seventh century. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that he, some, this seems to be like really, really disputed among scholars where there, it, there's it, any Jewish it Christian. Uh, it is, uh, it is. Uh, Increasingly disputed, but uh, as I say, at the same time, there are still very respected scholars who, who argue strongly for that case. And as yeah. I say, Giestrom is probably the most respected uh, scholar who, who's still holding that. But there are many, many more. And um, w one could also say, as I've already pointed out, uh, the, you know, there's the possibility that some or maybe all of this Jewish Christian influence was channeled through Jewish Christian literature as transmitted by the mainstream churches. As I said, the, the pseudo clementines the Odes of Solomon, for instance. And so, uh, right, so that would be one way that, um, you know, you could have, you wouldn't have to have actual, you know, Jewish Christians right, right. still yeah. living uh, and then living in the uh, Arabian Peninsula, but um, right, one one could consult uh, Strumza's works uh, and his most recent ones, right, which which one can find in PDF form on his academia.edu uh, pages, right, um, on J Jewish Christianity and Islam, and then he has another very good, intriguing uh, chapter called From Qumran, right, the, the Dead Sea sect, from Qumran yeah. to, to the Quran. So he draws this, uh, even some type of um, historical thread, right, from Qumran to the Quran. Um, but, but of course, he, he doesn't claim to be able to reconstruct all the links in the chain. And there are certain, certainly discontinuities and divergences as well as, you know, a, a lot of parallels. And also, it's, 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 it's important, um, right, to, to remember always, right, that there, there are parallels as well as distinctives, always, when you're talking about uh, different groups, right, that are, are flourishing in different centuries. Right, so there's never right. going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence or an unchanged, um, you know, s set of beliefs. Or even a single belief is right going to go undergo modification with the passage of decades and centuries. Yeah. Mm. Right. Great. Uh, that's a great answer. And uh, I so uh, moving from uh, just uh, from Christianity, just briefly before I uh, change the subject. Sure. Um, just to to, um, to Judaism, um, mm -hmm. do you think that he, uh, because you know Christianity was in all those heavy disputes of Christology for centuries and so on. So okay, that's understand perfectly understandable. But what about Judaism? Did the author of the Quran just uh, take the Christian argument for granted, like like it's a cultural background that uh, that the um, that the law is not eternal and that. Um, um, that there's a new covenant or something, do you think I just took that for granted? Or did he interpret some part of the Hebrew Bible differently, such that there would be a, uh, like a, a, a new covenant, but this time mm -hmm. it would be true? It would like. 
Yeah. Well, I, I think the best way to, to, to address that is, well, step back, try to see a larger picture at work, right? And, and um, what, what we see are the following parallels and points of contact, right? And so we do see right, in the Quran this trope that in previous times, right, God spoke to Israel uh, uh, by Moses, then he, then he spoke to Israel by Jesus, or Isa in Arabic. And now he's, God is speaking to, uh, you know, to uh, those who speak uh, Arabic, right? And the argumentation that is used sounds, it uses the same um, terminology that Paul developed and that we, we know from Paul's letters in the New Testament. So he's, the Quran is adapting the Pauline model right, that uh, God is now favoring the Gentiles, right? right? And he's reaching out to the Gentiles and now these Gentiles are Arabian, those who speak Arabic. Right. Right, and so uh, there, there is that, and that explains, uh, you know, some of the some of the ayat you mentioned earlier, um, where certain things, right, in the Torah get abrogated, right. So, right, right. this is this is the New Testament paradigm. It is a New Testament paradigm. There are many. There, there are conflict. Right, there are different viewpoints right. even in the New Testament on this. Right, so you have right. Matthew five seventeen, right? Jesus, it's Jesus is made to say, "I've not come right to to abolish the law, right, right. but but to fulfill it. That is to do it, right? And um, right. So, but but at the same time, later in the same gospel, you get the an increasing this trajectory, which increasingly seems to like counter that spirit of that saying. And so it would seem that the, there's maybe an ambiguity being exploited, right? So right. Um, in, that, in that saying, uh, that is, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, that is to do it. But at the same time, to fulfill it, right, may have this idea of supersessionism behind it. Yeah, I'm, right. I'm going to fulfill it and bring it to an end. And by the end of the Gospel of Matthew, that to me at least, not to all interpreters of Matthew, but to me at least, that seems to be where Matthew is going. But he's not totally systematic, right? And so he's not a systematic theologian. Nothing in the New Testament is systematic theology. Right. right. No, no, nothing in the Hebrew Bible is systematic theology. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. And uh, it would seem to fit to fit the the Quran's uh, theology. Uh, Perhaps even better than the uh, Hebrew or uh, the Hebrew Bible, uh, because the Quran like is very emphatic on God's freedom to do whatever He wants. So He could actually go back on His word in some sense. Like that's the a very, uh, more Islamic view of God. In some well, sense, I like think you're rebellious, so I'm gonna. It's basically uh, Quran basically uh, agrees with the, the pseudo Clementine multi covenant model. Right, so God has right. a covenant with 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 Israel through Moses, and then He makes a covenant with the Gentiles through Jesus, right? Which is an interesting right. concept. And so now the yeah. that seems to be mirrored in the Quran that idea. And now it's like, well, then now there's a new covenant with with the Arabians. But uh, apropos of what you said, though. Um, Yes, the Quran does stress right that God is free to. Uh, let's per, uh, I'll paraphrase it. God is free to speak to any people, right? And so he, he you know, so the idea that well, God can only speak. God has only spoken to the Jews, or God has only spoken to the Christians, right? So you, the the charge is that well, the Jews and the Christians are limiting God's power. Right and God's freedom. Right, he's as you say. He's uh, as you phrased it or, or paraphrased it. He's uh, free, um, right? Uh, and we cannot limit that freedom. Um, so God is God is certainly capable of speaking to anyone, right? But uh, that, uh, at least, right? Theologically, I mean, if you look at this 
right, from uh, his, historically viewed, right, the theology of rabbinic Judaism, for instance. Um, rabbinic Judaism would never say that it's impossible for God to speak to other peoples, right? Now, as you as right. you like as you likely know, right, in Judaism, there is no idea that the goyim, right, Gentiles or pagans have to become Jewish to be all right with God. You just have to fulfill a, a very small set of what, what are called Noahide laws, the laws of Noah, right? You don't kill, you don't, you know, commit gross sexual sins, things, that, you know, basic things that even James the, the Just is portrayed as having delineated in Acts 15 and this narrative of the first apostolic council, right? Those are the basic no, no laws of Noah. So, uh, you know, so there is no idea that you have to convert to Judaism to be all right with God or in Christian terms to be saved. Uh, you know, that's alien to, to, to Judaism, always has been. Uh, but at the same token, um, while rabbinic Judaism would say it is possible that God can speak or even has spoken to other nations, like let's say for the Arabians. But at the same time, um, it, it, uh, one would probably then qualify that and say that, well, it's possible, but we can't know that for sure as Jews. We, you know, because the only way that that would be demonstrable, right, is for an event like Sinai to be repeated, the giving of the Torah at Sinai, right. Right? because that was a national revelation. Every right. single because person in the nation, right, uh, it was revealed. And the Quran is aware of this, in fact. You know, the Quran does uh, concede that the, the revelation to uh, the prophet of Islam is, is not of the same order and category as the one to Moses or to Musa, right, in, in Arabic, because it said if it had been, if the revelation to the prophet of Islam had been the same, uh, had been of the same category of, of revelation as to Moses, the mountain would have shaken, right? And that's an allusion to what mm -hmm. did happen, right, at the Matan Torah, at the giving of the Torah. And so uh, also right. the, the Quran makes a whole list of all the prophets and, uh, including the prophet of, prophet of Islam and says that God gave revelation to them. But then it says, but he spoke to Moses, to Musa. So Musa is set apart from all the other prophets, even the prophet of Islam. And the, so the type of revelation that is given to Mo, Musa is of a higher category than the one that's given to even the prophet of Islam in the Quran. The Quran concedes this uh, in itself because, why? Because uh, all of the other revelations, according to all their accounts, uh, you know, the, the Christian accounts and uh, the, the Muslim accounts are basically private revelations. They may be to an individual prophet or maybe even to, you know, a group like 12 apostles or even, let's say, 500 saw Jesus. Well, for, you know, from a, Jew, a rabbinic Jewish perspective, the, the, that, that's really meaningless because that's not national. So you can't be sure of it. You can say, yes, all right, it's possible. But, you know, as rabbinic Jews, you, you just cannot know that for certain. And uh, so the attitude would be that of, of Maimonides, for instance, and that is, all right, so yes, we can see that Judaism and Christianity uh, are providential religions. They're, they're delivered to the world providentially by God to spread the knowledge of monotheism and the idea of the Mashiach or the Messiah right, among the, the, the nations to prepare them, right, for the messianic age and, and, and for monotheism in the present age, right. And so anyway, so that would be the, the rabbinic Jewish perspective. And one has to keep that in mind when you read the, when one reads the Quran and it's, it makes this charge that, you know, the people of the previous revelations, right, are, are limiting God's freedom to speak. Um, you know, that has to be set in, right. a, I think, in a larger context, though. So, so uh, the, the actual <clears throat> ideas and beliefs of Jews and Christians at the time are, are understood f more fully, right? 
Right. That's a, that's a way to put it. Way to put it. But it's still strange. Like it, it would make sense that if, if Muhammad argued like that, like, uh, yeah, you arrogant uh, Jews and Christians, like, uh, yeah, we can have uh, God can have our uh, separate covenant with us and so on. I mean, it it would be hard with sort of uh, a bit of with Pauline Christianity. But yeah, ignoring that, like uh, universal, unique salvation and all that stuff, like from with the Pauline view. But uh, from the Jewish view, yeah, that would make sense. Like a new prophet for uh, for the nations, like preparing the way and so forth. Okay, but the, the really weird thing is that the, is that he seems to uh, want to make the Jews uh, not just stay on their own path and like uh, you know uh, uh, follow the Torah and so on. But he seems mm -hmm. to want to change the Torah as well, and that's like a huge problem that Maimonides also says like uh, right well and again for the jews like you can't change stuff for the jews unless it's like a national revelation again uh, for right the jews, so but that, then you're trying to that again that's <clears throat> that's an influence uh, or a, uh, an analog to what we find in the new testament uh, to these ideas uh, that are interpreted as you know abrogating you know cost root for instance and that's what yep. that's one of the main issues right uh, that is at work there uh, in the Quran, right? When it's, it says that now I, I, I'm allowing you certain things that had not been allowed before. Exactly. Perhaps, right. exactly. Perhaps, perhaps Muhammad uh, didn't interpret like the, the part about uh, in the Torah, which says, which says these are laws are for us and our children forever, or this is an eternal uh, commandment or something like that. Perhaps he didn't interpret that so literally, like it's for a long, long, long time, but then, you know, a new covenant uh, would include the Gentiles as well as the Jews, and yeah, perhaps, perhaps that was that was in the air that idea that the uh, law would not be literally eternal. Perhaps uh, that's what Muhammad, because if you knew, if someone knows the Torah, that's like that's a, a huge problem that I see with Christianity. Like uh, Christianity claims to abrogate, and it never really justifies how this is possible for the Jews. Uh, Hebrews says. Uh, in Hayden, uh, Hebrews like uh, tries to quote Jeremiah 31, and mm -hmm. it's a pretty weak, in my view. I mean, it's, uh, it's a pretty weak claim because Jeremiah never says anything like, uh, I, "I gave you uh, old, I gave you old laws and you broke them, and I'm gonna give you a new covenant." It just says that, you know, it says Jeremiah 31 says that the covenant will be different in form, not in content. Right? It's like mm, right, uh, I will right, right, right. engrave it in your heart. But Hebrews, like the epistle to the Hebrews, tries to change that. And, but at least it attempted. Whereas the Quran, the author knows the Hebrew Bible as you've demonstrated, but it doesn't really justify <clears throat> doesn't really justify how it overcomes this eternal uh, binding with the new with the new attempt at claiming a new covenant. Like it doesn't even try to do what Hebrews, the epistle to the Hebrews did. But yeah, perhaps he didn't just, he simply did not interpret right, it so right. literally. Well, you have to understand also, <clears throat> as far as that point goes, the, the, the letter to the Hebrews is, is of a, a different genre than the Quran. The Quran, yeah, again, is yeah. a prophetic discourse. The right. letter to the Hebrews is a theological treatise, right? So, I mean, and it quotes, right? Word right. for word, you know, verses, pasukim, verses from, you know, the Torah and from the Psalms. And so it, it really is sort of this allegorical um, theological treatise, right? So we, we, we shouldn't expect right. to find just something be... similar uh, in, in um, the Quran. You know, yeah, so it would just be great if we had, uh, you know, a bigger corpus from... Uh, Muhammad and from the early uh, Muslim community, uh, mm -hmm. and the hadith don't really, the hadith don't really um, yeah. deal with these issues. They like they take things for granted and they're more practical. Yeah, it would be well, great the, if we had more material. Uh, the issue was arising because in the in the nascent movement, right, the, the, the nascent Islamic movement, there were Christians and J some Jews joining it. And at that point, there was no requirement to abandon, right, the the earlier religions or faiths, if we want to call them that, right. So, right, the Jews, the Christians could still practice their faith, and they would be associating with this new movement, right. And yeah, um, yeah I remember you saying to uh, to Derek in that video uh, that. Um, it was that relationship was severed like quite quite early on at least like 
-hmm. certainly not until certainly at the time of the hadith and all that stuff it was gone right uh, right, it's right very and, unfortunate very sad yes and um and, and you know and one already sees in the quran itself that there there's this the, the the relationship is deteriorating already it's starting to deteriorate already right so if you look at some of the earlier passages it seemed to be more ecumenical right and um but um and then though when the movement gets settled down in a big city and uh, right you they start uh you know having to codify social uh laws and rules uh, the conflict is all is already building right between yeah. uh, this new movement uh, and the the earlier revelations right it would be so gr it would be great if uh, if we had more of that material preserved instead of a lot of the hadith which are not very interesting in this in this in these matters uh, can you that if you would could tell us uh, something about the um, Muhammad and the uh, Merkava mysticism uh, uh, things that are it's something so strange that's in the hadith and a lot of people dismiss the hadith as unhistorical like uh, mm -hmm. and they're probably they probably are I'm, I'm no expert at all uh, on this at all and I think even experts are are not in agreement with what's the historical kernel in the hadith and so on um, but this is such a strange tradition to record that he met a Jewish boy and he had he, he's, he was doing things that are clearly um, there are this cannot be invented by Muslims like this is really uh, deep mystical stuff about Judaism that mm, it has yeah. to be true it, it must be some real historical tradition that he saw a Jewish boy doing these things and mm. just you know just uh, it would be interesting to hear Muhammad's relationship to this yes. uh, Merkava mysticism yes so, yeah. but yeah, yeah as you know scholars have written on that topic All right so you know, I, I could bring so, some new points uh, up for you in, in the future, but uh, right. as you know, I mean, a good case has already been made and it's out there in the literature. There, do you it, think, do you personally think that this is like, this is an historical event like that, that occurred? Like, uh, did Muhammad and the early, or the early community, if not the historical Muhammad, have some relationship with uh, this j very particular type of Jewish mysticism? It's really an, an overlook. Yeah, I, stuff. I would say if you if you keep it a general scenario, uh, yeah, we, there seems to be so, some historical kernel there. Yes, in those yeah, narrations. Very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. So, and that, yeah, maybe and some that other time. Been, this. Uh, but that could have been directly from a Jewish channel. Or it could have been from, you know, a quote unquote, a Jewish Christian channel. The, right. the latter is probably less probable. Right. But definitely, that, definitely not invented by Bukhari or but some by some guy, two hundred years later. I mean, it's unthinkable that that. Yeah, yeah, quote, we, right? yeah. So on the scale of probabilities, which is all we have as historians, right? right. Uh, yeah, it seems more probable that there's some kind of historical kernel to it than not very interesting yeah that would be a you know a massive massive topic uh perhaps some other time but thank you thank you so much for your answer eh? because i'm really the the hadith are really you know have that's that's a whole other huge discussion which which parts sure. which uh, parts are true and which parts are not. so i'll just uh keep just uh, make it one or two few uh, simpler sure. questions uh what do you think that the quran is referring to in Surah 7, 157, which is the uh, uh, Nabi al-Ummi, and the you will find uh, this Gentile prophet, perhaps, mentioned, or um, common folk prophet, uh, mentioned in the yes, Torah and the Gospel. This is a Pauline trope there. It, 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 uh, mm. The translation is debated, right? So, uh, unlettered, illiterate, but really, uh, what I think, in essence, what it's referring to is this is a, a prophet of a people who had not previously right. received a revelation. Right, because Surah 375 says, the Jews say, we have no obligation to the Umiyun, which, is, mm -hmm. which makes sense right. in the context of Gentiles, right? And so one Quranic, ha yeah. Right, and, and so one has to understand that 
the the metaphor right revelation what is revelation well there are various metaphors for revelation that are used in the quran which should not be taken literally they are metaphors like kitab kitab um, is a metaphor for revelation not for a uh it's not referring to the written form of a revelation it's just referring to revelation as such which can be written or purely oral so it's yeah. the kitab doesn't uh, re directly refer to a book that is written on earth right it's yeah. it's it's just a metaphor for revelation in fact kitab is uh as far as i know never used of an earthly book on the quran it always refers to the ummul kitab the heavenly book the the mother of the right. book but lady but in, uh, in Jewish terms, Lady Wisdom. Right, but if I may just on Surah 7, 157, this actually, it's a strange case because let me just uh, pull up the um, uh, word for word uh, thing uh, on the website. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it says, uh, they find him, they meaning the Jews and Christians, they mm -hmm. find him maktuban with them, maktuban indahum. So it seems that he's referring to something that the Jews and Christians actually have, uh, right? Maktuban comes from Kitab, right? So it, even if it's not like directly written, they could have access to to this uh, prophecy and this knowledge of the Gentile prophet or the prophet to the Gentiles, right? Yeah, it's one. It's 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 all we can say is it's it's quite enigmatic, and as you know, yeah. uh, Muslim apologists have tried to. F Tried yeah, to Deuteronomy fill in, 18. Tried to, Deuteronomy 18 or the Gospel of John, the Paraclete. Right. Right. So it's. There's really no answer, no easy uh, answer to this I one. I don't either. think so. Yeah. I, it, it, uh, um, yeah. It, it, it's, it deserves, um, deserves a fresh sort of a comprehensive study the whole issue right someone should write an entire book uh on on that ayah and try to you know try to get to the bottom of what might be going on right and yeah. um but right the the traditional hints right at deuteronomy uh, and at the gospel of john yeah, I've heard. I've good, I've good seen one which start. is actually. Yeah, I've I've seen one which is actually, kind of. Uh, it's not really my own, but it's it's a very very rare one, which is that one from. Uh, let me just uh, pull up the Bible, uh, from that. Um, this one is a very weak connection, but it actually could make more sense than than Deuteronomy or or John, uh, yeah. as they are today and in in the manuscripts of the time as well, of course. But um, it would make more sense, which is the one in. Uh, more sense in the sense that Muhammad could be referring to that. Uh, um, oh, it, 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 this is a bit of a silly uh, proposal, or it could be uh, not very good. But it was that one about um, that uh, it's a song of um, I think it's Genesis 49, where it says, "Like the scepter will not be taken from Judah until uh, Shiloh comes," and it could be interpreted as the traditional Jewish and Christian way, which is. Uh, it will not depart from Judah like uh, ever because it's it will stay with the Messiah, the Messiah of of, of, of David. But it could also be, I, I mean, at least from an English linguistic point of view, uh, it could be in the in the original Hebrew. It could I could be completely wrong. But right. in, in English, in English, it seems that it could be saying, "Hang on, okay, so it's for a long, long time. It's with Judah, so it's with the most uh, noble tribe of the Jews and so on, the the preeminent tribe. But then the scepter will pass on to." uh to someone else like outside the great lineage of judah so it's it's a possibility that i've heard too that's also right. somewhat the, intriguing yeah there are others also i mean that 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 is islamic apologetics have invoked right there are, there are verses in the torah and in the psalms that mention god coming from <clears throat> like this arabian right coming from Timon, god god came from Timon and so all of that stuff but but, but these usually seem to me, that they should be problematic for from a Muslim perspective, right? Because um, it, you know, God came from from Sinai, for instance, right? Well, what's that have to do with 
God, a supposed prophet of God. Right, right, so, exactly. Right, so this, you know, just because some Arabian uh, geography is mentioned, uh, it's, 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 um, yeah. I mean, it's, it would seem that Muslims, if they took a look at it again, right, it's sort of self-defeating. Yeah, words. exactly. I, I, just, just to uh, like the uh, Gospel I, of Barnabas. This. Oh yes, yeah, that's, uh, that's Italian, a disaster. That's Spanish an Gospel disaster. of Barnabas <laughs> that some Muslims, right, at, at, you know, start advocating for. Oh, right? yes. But but you know, it, it claims that's that, a bad choice. that Muhammad is. The Messiah, the Messiah, right? Which <laughs> yeah. is which contradicts, you know, Islam standard Islamic, yeah, all yeah. Islamic belief, right? So you know, it's right. just get, uh, people fall into inconsistencies when they're in the when they lose themselves right. in apologetics. You know? Yeah, just to just as a final note to this mysterious question of the of the Surah Seven One Fifty Seven. Um, yeah, I would just... yeah, uh, the, yeah. The the, the uh, I was addressing the first part of it. What what is the 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 grammar mean at the right. beginning of it, uh, but then the second part also. All right, so we covered that as well. Uh, which my basic answer is, I don't really have an opinion. That uh, you know, I can only refer to the opinions out there. You know what that might be alluding to, right? Where exactly. in the Gospels or the Torah or the yeah. Tanakh. And just uh, just as a final uh, note on that on that subject. Uh, uh, it seems to be that there's a tradition in Bukhari, which in this case may not be historical because it 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 seems like uh, something that would be a, a very acute apologetic uh, thing in those uh, in those times. Mm -hmm. because, but the tradition in Bukhari actually says quote paraphrases Isaiah 42. So modern apologists quoting Isaiah 42, like the servant, uh, the servant, That's another seems one. to seems to go back to at least Bukhari, but. It's still there's really no. It doesn't seem very plausible that this is a, a tradition going back to the companions that it cited, right? Uh, but that it's the only link we have, I think, uh, that to uh, that claims to be from the companions of Muhammad saying, "Oh yeah, 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 he's mentioned in the Torah, meaning Torah in this in a more broader sense." In uh, it doesn't say it's Isaiah, but it paraphrases the the one who will not cry in the streets and he's the servant of God and so on and so on and so forth and it quotes the servant of Isaiah but yeah I I wouldn't think that would necessarily go back to the companions of, of the prophet right yeah no way to know yeah, it seems a, like an, not a time machine as I say yeah <laughs> yeah it seems like a later apologetic because by the time that Bukhari thing was written uh, there were already works by a lot of uh, uh, Muslim apologists finding, uh, looking all the way through the Bible. So yeah, we, it's just a very, very mysterious uh, uh, thing. Yeah, yeah well, it probably was not as mysterious to the uh, original audience of the Quran, but you know, because uh, throughout the entirety of the Quran, um, it is obviously assumed that the audience knows the larger stories that are just briefly alluded to in the Quran, elliptically yeah. right, alluded to. So the original audience uh, knew much more than, you know, than we do, right? So it may, yeah. it, it may not have been mysterious to them at all. And they may have known exactly where in the, in the Tanakh or the, the, the gospels you know this that this illusion was being made perhaps to. yeah right perhaps it's not even in the canonical uh, tanakh or or uh, new test or new testament or perhaps right. it's in some local writing or some local tradition right it could be you know uh, some, midrash, some midrash yeah exactly or no yeah it could be yeah, right. Um, so yeah, um, I have I had a related one uh, similar to this one, but it's uh, it's not really very important because, but uh, which was uh, because Surah two one forty six uh, says that the the um, the uh, Jews and Christians should should know are you know are being rebellious and are being uh, uh, unworthy by not knowing the Qibla, the direction of prayer, the new direction of prayer. And they, they know this direction of prayer as one of their own sons, uh, I think. Because there is also some uh, some uh, 
other uh, translations that say that this is not referring to the Qibla, it's referring again to Muhammad, uh, so basically repeating 7157, but, but some say it refers to the Qibla, like uh, 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 the, the Qibla to uh, pr presumably to Mecca, so it's, it's also strange where he would get that idea from, that the Jews and Christians should know this new direction of prayer instead of Jerusalem, because it seems like it's not... It, 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 it seems like it's going from Jerusalem to some some place else, right? It's in, and it says the Christians and Jews should know this. Perhaps it has to do with some more ancient Abrahamic connection, like one of the old uh, Abraham shrines. Perhaps it's not. Perhaps it's not referring to Mecca or something. I don't know, because it does not say that it's to Mecca, right? Right. Well, that's that's of course one of the issues, right, in, in Quranic studies currently. Is, uh, we, we shouldn't start off assuming right, uh, that we are to apply later knowledge, right, later interpretation right, from Kalam, from the Ahadith, all of this, right, onto the text of the Quran. So right. let's just start with the text of the Quran and, and uh, right, try to interpret it beginning there. And um, so, right. Right, but there's. It, the issue there may be that right, we don't have the entire context, right? So again, Christians and Jews, so what does that mean? Could that mean, could that be referring to Jews and Christians who were, with, who were in the nascent new movement, the new, new Islamic movement? Right, this band of believers of the faithful. Right, that's a model that uh, Fred Donner right has, has developed. Right, and so yeah. the anyway there that's a possibility that many might overlook is that uh, the Jews and Christians there may not be right meant in general, but those who are in this movement. Right, and so maybe some proclamation has been made. Right, so we've we've. The, the Qibla direction has been changed and they should have known it since they're in this nascent, you know, faith, the movement of the faithful, the group, the band of the faithful. Right. That's one possibility. Yeah, because it's, yeah, it, it, there's really no other great tradition. In fact, even the tradition of praying towards Jerusalem itself, it's like only in a few places in the, in the Bible, right? Uh, you know, following the example of Daniel and so on. Um, there's really no other great Bible, emphasis but on it, but it, but it, but it's you know it's an it's an important part of praxis right in right. Christianity even though it's yeah. not mentioned in the Bible but you know right, right. In, in, in when churches were erected you had to have the altar facing right the the specific yeah. direction and and all of this so I mean that's not mentioned anywhere in in, in the Christian scriptures but we know yeah, that 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 was you know a very important point. Right, and um, so, and of course, Jews have always prayed towards Jerusalem, right, where, towards yep. the temple. Um, what do you think, what do you think, regardless of the Quran, uh, just forgetting mm -hmm. the, the original context of the Quran for, for a second, what, what do you think is going on with the city of Mecca? I, I think there are more allusions to Jerusalem in the Quran than, than mm. is usually um, recognized. And tropes about Jerusalem are applied apparently to Mecca in the Quran. When, right, so the, it's usually considered in the Quran where it's, it mentions the secure city. That's how it's usually translated, yeah. that that's referring to Mecca. Maybe it is, but even if it is, the Arabic is is directly cognate to the, the Hebrew title for Jerusalem in the book of Isaiah. And that is, it's not the secure city, it's the faithful city, right? And so Jerusalem is somehow being appropriated and applied to in a new situation, right? Yeah. There's one more question you, you sent me, which I can uh, deal with instantly, very, very easily. <clears throat> right. Um, and that, that's the question you had about Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. Oh, right. right. The, yeah, that the, was... Uh, the Torah's legislation. Just to, yeah, just to... That was part of the beginning, uh, the, the initial part about how could the, Quran, how could the Quranic author, um, uh, you know, um, be so familiar with one and then command something 
that seems to be not just in contradiction, but like in a very, very, very uh, uh, uncomfortable way, uh, well, contradicting yeah. a law of Moses. Right. Well, this this is how it it, it could happen, and that is that um, right. So so Deuteronomy says that to remarry someone you have divorced previously is an abomination, right? Right. And now the the Quran says so Surah Bakara, uh, you know, Surah to the, the uh, Ayah to one hundred thirty, I believe, uh, right? Yeah. So says that's all right. You know, it, 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 there is a certain scenario where it would be possible to remarry someone you've previously divorced right and so your question was well you know that's all right i'll tell you how that can work and it wouldn't be problematic even from like a jewish point of view and that is we're, we're uh the, the arabians are not jews so that legislation does not apply to them it is only an abomination right. for jews right yeah. And and the way I can support that is all you have to do is look at Leviticus 11, the legislation on kosher and, and kosher food and the, the non-kosher animals. Eating those animals is said to be an abomination, but that's only for Israel, right? right. So this abomination uh, regarding um, marriage, divorce, remarriage of someone who's uh, been previously, you've previously divorced, um, it's not an abomination for Gentiles, uh, only right. for, only for Jews. Yeah. Right. So all you have to do is be careful about the word abomination and see. Well, where is this word used elsewhere in the Torah? Right. right. Then you know the the solution uh, appears. Yeah. If it wasn't. Quickly. Yeah. If it wasn't used in Leviticus, like uh, it would be a really really problematic. So it's it, not rooted in natural law. Right, which which would right. apply to all peoples, but it's it's a specific commandment for Israel, and it's an abomination for Israel, right, to di to disobey this commandment, just as it is to disobey the 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 kosher and the kosher. Yeah. Uh, that's fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So thank you so much, Doctor Zinner. Um, and uh, maybe we can do this again some other time. So sure. Thank you very sure. much.